Welcome to the Where Do Gays Retire podcast, where we help you in the LGBTQ plus community find a safe and affordable retirement place. Join Mark Goldstein as he interviews others who live in gay-friendly places around the globe. Learn about the climate, cost of living, healthcare, crime and safety, and more. Now, here's your host, Mark Goldstein. Today, we're traveling to Barcelona, Spain. We have our guest, Reed Martin. I'll tell you a little bit about Reed. Reed Martin was born and raised in Woodland Hills, California, a suburb of Los Angeles located in the San Fernando Valley. After graduating from California State University, Northridge, with a BA in radio, television, and film, Reed got his start in the entertainment industry working as an apprentice editor on the Tom Hanks comedy Bachelor Party. For the next several years, he worked as an assistant editor and sound editor on a dozen or so featured films, before landing a job in motion picture, advertising, cutting and producing movie trailers and television spots for more than 200 films, including Unforgiven, Batman Forever, As Good As It Gets, The Bodyguard, Interview with a Vampire, and The Birdcage. Well, I saw mostly all of those. In addition to his award-winning work on movie trailers, Reed helped create advertising campaigns for many global brands such as McDonald's, Burger King, Quaker Oats, and Volkswagen. He was a professional voice actor for more than a decade. His voice has been featured on numerous radio and television commercials. After a 25-year career as an editor, writer, and producer, Reed and his partner Julian sold their house, put everything into storage, and traveled the world for almost two years. Upon returning to the U.S., the couple decided to reinvent themselves professionally, and together, They embarked on a successful career buying and selling commercial real estate, specializing in multifamily income properties in Las Vegas and Southern Nevada. Over the years, Reed and Julian have lived in Palm Springs, as well as Santiago, Chile, and Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Mexico City, Mexico. The now married couple just celebrated their 40th anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. And currently semi-retired and living with their two Karen Terriers, Tater and Taffy, in beautiful and vibrant Barcelona, Spain. Well, Reed, that's quite a biography. That you have a lot of accomplishments there. Uh, and uh, welcome, hats. <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Reed, tell us, tell our audience where you moved from last and why you chose to live in Barcelona and which cities did you visit in Spain before you decided on Barcelona? Well, thanks for having me. First of all, we were living in Henderson, Nevada, which is a city right adjacent to Las Vegas. And we were there for the last 10 years. We'd previously lived in Palm Springs. So we were in the Mojave desert for like 15 years And when like the early part of the pandemic happened and we were basically kind of isolating, Julian and I would take the dogs out in our neighborhood and we'd walk around and just talk about, you know, what do you want to do? And uh, we had been kind of like the last, maybe the last two years in Vegas, we were just like sick and tired of the heat because it, it could get to be like 112, 140 degrees. And it's just, you know, unbearable. So for us anyways, anyway, so we decided, we thought, let's shake things up a bit. And I don't know exactly how it happened, but we decided we wanted to sell the house and sell our properties and move to Europe somewhere. So we decided on Spain for a couple of reasons. One is the language. Julian is a native Spanish speaker. He was born in Chile. And the other reason is we'd been to Spain before. We traveled all over Spain. We love the Mediterranean. The climate's beautiful. The people are friendly. All the, all the, you know, the pluses. And it would give us easy proximity to Europe to travel and just, you know, try a, a different lifestyle. We ended up with choosing Barcelona. Maybe I, I would say maybe 
ha- kind of happenstance. I, I don't know. It was just one of those things. We we decided we were going to go to Barcelona first, maybe rent an apartment, get a car, drive around Spain since we hadn't been here for a few years, well, a number of years, and get a, a better lay of the land. But once we got into Barcelona, we were like, ah, this is a great city. It's, it's just it's got everything we wanted in terms of culture and museums and food and, and all those things. And it just seemed like a good fit for us. And it was cooler than 120 degrees. Cooler than 120 degrees. It You know, it gets warm here in the summer, but the winters are beautiful. It's just beautiful all year round. Did you scout out any other cities in Spain? Well, you just saw uh, Barcelona fell in love. Well... A number of years ago, we took a road trip throughout Spain and we've been to pretty much every, we haven't been to Bilbao or the northern part of Spain, but we'd been to Madrid and down the the coast and all the way down to Sevilla and Marbella. And I had originally wanted to live on the water, but and the other thing is that we were looking online, we were looking to buy real estate, not to buy it online, but to view it online. So we were kind of making our lists of our favorite properties. Yeah. And I think most of our favorite properties were in Barcelona. And I think we wanted to just give it a try here first and then go from here. Yeah, that's understandable. So tell us, geographically speaking, where is Barcelona located within Spain and where are the beaches located in Barcelona as opposed to, you know, from center city? Yeah. Barcelona is about a two and a half hour drive, I'd say southwest of the border of France. It's on the Mediterranean, so it's right on the water. It's a port city. There are beaches in Barcelona that from the central part of town where we live in the Ejampla is a 20 minute walk to the beach or a three, three stop Metro ride to the beach. And there are a number of beaches along the coast within easy Metro or easy walking. There's gay beaches, there's nude beaches, there's dog friendly beaches. There's, just non-smoking beaches. I mean, there's a, a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's super easy to get to the beach from here. Okay. How about the climate? You know, you came from a desert. Yeah. So Tell us about the climate in Barcelona. Uh, the summer's hot and humid. And I mean, not to offend anybody who lives in the desert, but pretty I much. I do, myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for us, almost anything was an improvement. Even though we did like it. I mean, we lived in the Mojave Desert for 15 years and it was the first year you're basically going, what the hell did we do? But then (laughs) after that, your body adjusts. Right. But for us, the climate here is great. It's in the summertime. I think it, it gets to be about an average of about 84, 85 degrees. It's a bit humid in August and July. The winters are for us beautiful they could be a little not super rainy it does get some rain here but it's not super rainy and uh i I would say in the winter the daytime averages are about 50s to 60s during the day and the rainy seasons march and april but it's mostly like drizzle there are a couple days where you get downpours but it's just for us beautiful that's ideal you know, the winter is not too cold. Summers are really not too hot. It doesn't sound hot. I mean, yeah, it could get hot with humidity, but it's it just really sounds ideal, like an ideal place. So tell us, does Barcelona have an expat, a large expat community? And have you made friends with any of the locals or expats? The answer is yes and yes. There is a fairly large expat community. A lot of Brits, a number of Americans. We've made friends with a few people so far. The we've made friends. We made friends with a gay couple who just moved here from Hong Kong, 
And I would say it's a pretty international city. So there are a lot of expats from all over the world living here. You hear every language. Yeah. Yeah. And I find it important. Well, you guys know the language for the most part. Julian knows the language and, you know, he's fluent in Spanish, right? Oh, so yeah. Makes... Well, he was born in Chile, even yeah. though, well, he's an American citizen and a Chilean citizen. But so he grew up speaking Spanish. I just grew up being around it. Right. So it's easier as, as long as one of you know the language. So I would find it a little bit easier to assimilate to another country. Yes. In, I would say in the bigger cities in Spain, Barcelona, Madrid, and definitely on the, like the Costa del Sol, Marbella, English is pretty widely spoken. I would say, especially by people under 30, 35, mm -hmm. lots of English spoken, but it definitely helps to speak Spanish. Yeah. You won't be excluded from everything, but if you don't speak Spanish, you're not going to have in-depth conversations with people. Right. At least try. Gonna have, yeah. And people are pretty friendly about it. I mean, if you make a mistake, nobody busts your balls over it. It's not like nobody's, you know, that's the biggest thing about when you're trying to learn a language. For many people, you can be intimidated and be embarrassed to make mistakes. But I find that people in Spain will correct you in a polite way if you kind of right. ask them to. And I think they give you a fair amount of respect for trying. Yeah, I would think that would be the case too. Oh. You're trying, so they feel appreciative. And they probably want to speak back to you in English. Yes, <laughs> they know I, English. Yeah, I get that a lot where people are like, I want to practice. Because I'll say, I need to practice my Spanish. My Spanish. And they'll say, okay, good. I want to practice my English. And I'm like, you know, of course I'm going to say yes, but that's not what I'm <laughs> right. looking for. Right. So you don't think coming to Barcelona, not knowing really much Spanish, we're learning now, at least uh -huh. my husband is like, he's like on it every day. So you think with our little Spanish that we know we would be able to survive and get by oh, yeah. at least yeah. for now? No problem. You know, one, one of the big challenges of Barcelona and the, the Catalonia area is that they speak Catalan. And even though there are two official languages, Spanish and Catalan, in Barcelona, you do see a lot, like most of the, the signs in the metro, the signs in stores, the signs on the road, they're in Catalan. So it poses an additional challenge to a, a non-native speaker right. who's trying to learn the language, because just when you think you, you're kind of getting the hang of things a curveball's thrown at you, but it's doable. And, you know, the thing is, Barcelona is just filled with language schools and they're actually a pretty good place to meet other people who are in your, in a similar situation. Yeah. And, you know, because you're all kind of thrown in together. And so it's easy to form friendships that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would get confused if I saw signs in Catalan. I wouldn't even know if it's Catalan well, or Spanish. Well, I mean, you, uh, like you go into a metro and instead of it saying salida for exit, it exit. says, it says sortie. Oh. Like the French word. So oh, wow. it's, you just kind of get used to recognizing it. And is it because of the geography where Barcelona is located, it's near France, that language kind of became... I, you know, I don't know exactly. I think that this region of Spain has always kind of had its own, I don't want to say independence necessarily, even though there was a civil war, yeah. but they have their own identi identity, which is uniquely Catalan which is different than anywhere else in the country. So right. it is a little combination of Spanish and French and some other things thrown in. Like you see parking and it's spelled parking, but 
with pronounced parking, but it's got like a couple X's or something. You know, there's always like a few X's and extra C's in there, but it's different than Spanish, but it, it, it's more similar to English. It's a, it, uh, but it's, it's got a, its own, own culture and uh, it's interesting. Yeah. But it does, definitely poses a, a little bit of a challenge if you're trying to learn Spanish because it just yeah. adds an extra layer. Right. To like, what is this? Okay. Reed, is living in an LGBTQ plus community important to you? And if so, are you living in one or it, does that exist in Barcelona or is it just so open that really the, we're everywhere? Yeah. So for us, it's never been like a priority to live in an LGBTQ neighborhood. It's certainly nice to be able to have access to them where you can walk around and it's not a big deal. But in Barcelona in general, it's not a problem at all. Barcelona is pretty, I would say on the bohemian side, it's a little bit of mixture of like Greenwich Village in New York and San Francisco. So it's a little, it, it's not super buttoned up. Right. Uh, there is a fairly large gay community here. There is a fairly large gay community, like a neighborhood, which is, you know, gayborhood. They right. call it, it's in the Ejample, and uh, I think they call it Gejample. And uh, it's filled with, as you'd imagine, gay bars, nightclubs, drag shows, drag bars, gay owned restaurants. And I'd say it's fairly big. Okay. That's kind of refreshing because here in Phoenix, <clears throat> we're in like our little bubble. So in the area that we live in, we like to go to, it's a restaurant. It's not considered a gay restaurant, but all the patrons are <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. So we feel comfortable there yeah. and we just want to move to a place where we feel comfortable and don't feel threatened at all. Yeah. So in living in Palm Springs, obviously that was like, you know, gay. Yeah. So that was never an issue. Las Vegas was never an issue for us for, we didn't really have any problems there, but Las Vegas has a very strange, like it doesn't really have a gay neighborhood per se and everything's kind of spread out. So you don't get any sense of that here. It's, you definitely get a sense of it because it's in some ways being living close to the Castro and, but the whole city, I would say in the central part of the city, you see gay people walking hand in hand. You see, I mean, of all ages too, not, it's not just like younger people who are just like, they don't give a shit, you know, right. but it's people who are, I mean, the, the other day I saw a couple that I'm sure was in their late sixties and they were walking hand in hand you see it all the time. That's so nice. Gay guys, lesbians, nobody bats an eye. People, and also gay people show public, uh, what's a, I forget what the term is, public displays of affection all the time. And nope, nobody gives a shit. Nobody. Bats no, I mean, I, I see gay, gay guys kissing in the metro and like nobody cares. Nobody cares. That is definitely, and cool. I get the sense. I get the sense that most of Spain, at least most of the bigger cities in Spain, are like that. I, I, I was just in Madrid. I didn't see to the same extent, but I mean, I saw gay couples walking hand in hand, and it was like no big deal. The only people that would like look might be a foreigner, but Spaniards. It, I get the sense that it's pretty taboo to be homophobic, at least publicly. But, you know, I have limited experiences and I don't live in Podunk. So I don't know if, you know, if I'm, if we were in some rural area, it would uh, be different. If that would be different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So does living in a touristic city like Barcelona create problems with obtaining real estate or living in noisy neighborhoods? The answer is no. I don't think there are any special problems living in Barcelona or a uh, trying to get real estate or buy something or rent an apartment or having limited choices in for neighborhoods the the better parts of the city have more competition for 
the better apartments and the better apartments could be anything from, you know, places with terraces and outdoor spaces or places for dogs and those types of things. Those there's, it's competitive for those for rentals. So if you're coming here, you probably want to hire a real estate agent to help you find something in terms of buying real estate. I don't think it's any more competitive than any other city in the world. Real estate's not flying. It's not a super hot market. That's for sure. No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I don't think because there are a lot of tourists here, I don't think that has any bearing on your ability to either buy or rent an apartment. Okay. And it's not noisy, like with all the bars and clubs. I don't know if you're in one of those areas, but. Yeah. Julian and I, we, we are, I'm going to do air quotes here, but we're relatively savvy real estate investors. I mean, we've been doing it for many years. So there are things that we look out for. Now we wouldn't buy, we wouldn't buy an apartment in a building that had bars and restaurants down below. It's just not going to happen. Right. But those, I mean, those exist, obviously. We don't, there are plenty of streets that are relatively quiet, but if you want quiet, you probably don't want to go to Barcelona necessarily because it's a big city. It's like going to New York, York. you know? Yeah. If you're from New York or Chicago, you're going to come here and you get, and you're going to think, oh, it's actually pretty tame, pretty quiet. People don't honk their horns. It's, it's pretty mellow. If you come from Kansas, you're going to be like, holy shit, what happened? You know? <laughs> right. So I think it's all relative, but nah, I don't find it particularly noisy. I definitely get that. Yeah. Coming, being a, a native New Yorker myself, I'd probably find it. Yeah. You pretty, wouldn't even bat an pretty, eye. Yeah, yeah. Pretty relaxing with no honking of horns. Well, you know, they, I'm studying the driver's test right now, and I could tell you all about that in a bit, but oh, I heard about uh, that. one, one of the laws is that you can't in a city, you can't honk your horn unless you really need to, you know, of course you had no defined need, but right. so you don't have a lot of random people just honking horns like you would in every other city in the U S. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. refreshing. You have to tell us about the, about the uh, driver's test. <laughs> I understand that you in six months you have to if you don't if you have a u.s license you have to take a test from the beginning yeah i'll just briefly give you the idea if you are from the u.s or canada and you want to live here once you get permanent residency you have six months after six months your license is no longer valid now if you're from bolivia chile or a number of other i mean you could be from i mean there's the list is very strange. I mean, you could be a rickshaw driver in Mogadishu and you can come and they'll swap your license. But if you're from the U S if you're from the U S or Canada, they're like, Oh no, there's no, there is no reciprocal agreement between the two countries, which sucks because to get a driver's license in Spain, there's a bit of a rigmarole. You are pretty much required to go through a driving school and pay exorbitant fees for the luxury of being able to take the test. And the test questions are beyond absurd. And there are something like 900 different possibilities. They only give you 30 30 on the written, there's 30 questions and you can only miss three. Oh, and so if you're not a good test in taker, Spanish. no, you can take the written in English actually, which oh, is good. Can? Yeah. But you can't take the drive, the, I don't know what they call it. Practical. You can't take the, right, the actual driving, driving the actual driving test that's in Spanish, but all you need is like remedial Spanish to understand, go forward, stay, you know, turn right, turn left. Right, it's, left. It, it's not that big of a deal, but You know, it's a little intimidating. I've got a pilot's license and I've been flying for 40 years and I'm checked out on like seven different types of aircraft and (laughs) now I need to get a driver's license. So I'm definitely sweating it, you know, (laughs) that's a challenge. definitely sweating it. Let me ask, does Julian have a driver's license from Chile? 
Well, is he, that he does allowed? not. He, yes. Well, no, he would be able, if he had a driver's license from Chile, he could just go to the equivalent of the DMV and swap it because right. if you're, For if simple. you're, yeah, if you are from a country that Spain colonialized at some point, they give you priority in certain things. So in other words, and this is kind of going back to one of the reasons we chose Spain is because Julian has Chilean citizenship and Chile was a colony of Spain, they offer Chilean citizens a fast track to citizenship Citizenship. or residency. And so with the licensing thing for cars, yes, if you have a Chilean license, you will get priority. You'll get it. It's easier. You can just swap it. You can just swap it. But uh, gringos, no. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So uh, it, it sucks. But it's, you know, the thing is, it's doable. It's all doable. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel, well, we'll get into that a little bit later, but do you feel like you need a car? If you live in Barcelona or if you live, live in Madrid, you don't need a car. In fact, I think living in the city, it can be a bit of a hindrance. It's kind of like living in New York City. I don't think you'd really want to have a car unless you were going to no. go out on like weekend trips or do you know go to New Jersey or out to Long Island or right. wherever. But then you um, can rent. And there's tr- there are trains everywhere and metros and the transportation network's excellent here. So no, you don't really need a car here. But if you do want to do road trips, you need a car. Gotcha. How about uh, tell us a little bit about Barcelona's art and culture scene? I mean, I know there's this big city vibe. And so can you tell us some examples of what they have to offer as far as arts and culture? Yeah. Coming from Las Vegas, we were a little starved for culture. Again, I don't want to offend anybody from Las Vegas, but Las Vegas has the strip shows or meaning Las Vegas strip shows, right. you know, the big Cirque du Soleil and all those types of things. But there really aren't any museums Museums. or there, there, there's like very little in terms of cultural activities in Las Vegas. And we're not cultural snobs, but it's nice to be able to have a museum or an art gallery at your disposal if you do feel like going to do something somewhat cultural. So Barcelona has everything. It's got tons of museums. It's got a great modern art museum, contemporary art museum. It's got a Picasso museum. It's got Dolly, some Dolly stuff. Nice. It's got, it's got a lot going for it in terms of museums. And there are galleries all over the place with local artists showing. And uh, about theater. There's tons of theater here. In fact, we saw a production of Off Broad of, what did we see? Singing in the Rain. All right. Uh, yeah. So it was actually pretty good. Was it and in English or Spanish? It was in, it was oh, in, no, it was in Spanish, but most of the songs were in English. Or I would say, yeah, about at least 70% of the songs were in English. So it was kind of a mix, a mix, but it was a a fun production. They have shows, they have tons of theaters here. They have opera, which I don't personally care for, but the opera house is spectacular. So I will go see an opera here just Just to, to just to go go in. There is a music theater from an academy. I'm going to get it wrong. So I probably won't even mention the name, but it's just the theater and the building are just incredible. I mean, and she's like, just such great architecture Architecture. everywhere you'd look. So there are a lot of cultural things to do here. There's great food and just a lot of activities if if you want them. And like I say, we're not big cultural snobs, but occasionally we're like, Hey, you want to go to to a museum? Sure. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I love that. And, And that's why I love New York growing up in New York. Yeah. If you wanted to do it, not that we did it every weekend or anything, but right. if we it's wanted there. to, it was yeah. there. And yeah. How about, and um, I imagine Phoenix is probably similar. 
in this it sense. Is, in uh, fact, similar to, to uh, Las Vegas, where it's like there's not a ton going on. There isn't. And but luckily, where we are, we can walk to the Phoenix Theater. They have live, you mm-hmm. know, theater, and we can walk to the art museum. And there's an American Indian museum, the Heard mm-hmm. Museum, mm-hmm. the largest in the world, I believe. It's here. It's right across the street. So that that I'm thankful for. It's just nice to have those things in a city. How about how about a movie theater? Do they have English movie theaters? Yes, they do. There are movie theaters all over the place. As you would guess, they're not that popular anymore because I think since COVID, that really killed the in theater experience. The last time we saw a movie here was Maybe six, eight months ago, we saw some really bad sci-fi movie. I can't even remember what the name of it was, but there were like 12 people in the audience. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was at and a it time- was in English? It was in English, yeah. You could choose. You could, you know, they have different showings for if you want to watch it in Spanish or you want it in English with Spanish subtitles or just in English. A lot of theaters- Especially the multiplexes have a variety. Wow. You can see movies in English are all over the place. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. You probably won't find that in many cities, but yeah, that's great that it's in Barcelona. Tell us about the food scene. Are you guys foodies at all? What's the restaurant scene like? Do they have five-star Michelin restaurants? I'm sure they do in a big city like Barcelona. Tell yeah. us about that. Barcelona is a, I would say it's definitely a foodie capital. We are not foodies per se, but we do like to go to some nice restaurants occasionally. We love good food, obviously, but it's got, I think my understanding is there's something like 22, 23 Michelin star rated restaurants here in Barcelona. And there is a much wider variety of food here than I remember from our last visit. Like there are great China, there's a huge Chinese population now. So there are great Chinese restaurants, especially, and I say great there. It's not like aunt B's kitchen, you know, it used to be (laughs) cause it used to be kind of like that. It's stuff that competes with New York and San Francisco and East LA good stuff. There's Malaysian restaurants, there's Indian restaurants, Pakistani restaurants, not a lot of Thai restaurants, but they exist. Great Italian food, great Spanish food, great tapas. There's there's a w- wide variety of food here. And I would say you kind of have to hunt for a bad restaurant. I mean, they exist, but right, yeah, people take their food pretty seriously here. So you're the first person to tell me that Barcelona has a variety of Chinese restaurants because Mm. other places, other cities in Spain, I believe, are lacking Chinese. They're also lacking Mexican. Does Barcelona have Mexican? (laughs) So (laughs) Barcelona does have a few Mexican restaurants. They are It's going to now contradict what I just said. They're mediocre at best. They're pretty I believe it. However, we have found a place that is very similar to Chipotle, mm-hmm. which I know sounds stupid to most Americans. They're like, oh, shit, that's what you consider good Mexican. No, but it's pretty good compared to a lot of have. Mexican food. So we can we there's a place in Europe that has great burritos and it's a fast food place. But by and large, the Mexican restaurants here it's like, you kind of want to say, it's like, have you guys ever been to Mexico? You know, it's that kind of thing where they're right. like, uh, they don't get it. And I understand the Spanish people, Spaniards are not crazy about hot tasting food. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love spicy food, but as I've gotten older, it doesn't love me back. Right. Yeah. And... Being in Spain, that's working in my favor because when they're like, ooh, muy picante, that, mean, <laughs> that means it's like, eh, it's, it's not that spicy. Oh, okay. If it's spicy for them. But they think it is. Oh, yeah. 
it's yeah, they don't really go in for spicy food. But if you go to a Malaysian restaurant or an Indian or Pakistani restaurant, yeah, it'll be spicy. So here's another good. Be. Here's another question I have for you. Does your way of eating now in Spain, the Mediterranean lifestyle, has that, do you think that has changed the way you feel at all? Do you feel any better by yeah, eating the food? I feel fatter. <laughs> uh, I feel and look fatter. <laughs> the, you don't look fat at all. The, you know, it, it's funny. <laughs> the food here is so good that I tend to eat way more. I would say the thing that has changed the most habit wise is the getting used to the hours. Yeah. Because restaurants don't open for lunch until one. And then they close and don't open for dinner until eight. And eight o'clock, I don't know. It's fine if you're going out with some friends and you want to have a, a, a pregame and have a drink, meet for cocktails, and then go out to dinner. That's fine. Right. But for us, like eight o'clock. You're so used to, yeah. I'm yeah, so used to six I'm, o'clock. Yeah. As I've gotten older, I find myself eating earlier. And yeah. so that's a little bit of a challenge. Test. The Look, there's plenty of healthy things I could be eating here. And there are tons of health, I, I don't want to say health food restaurants, but vegan restaurants and places that specialize in salads and greens and stuff like that. And we try, Julian is way better than me on this. I'm just like, you know, meat, 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 you know, <laughs> no, nah, it's... I'm on the rise here, <laughs> but, but you don't look it. But yeah. what, what I would think is, I guess this is any place in Europe. So they don't allow some of the chemicals that we put in our foods here mm -hmm. in the States. They don't yeah. allow that there. Yes. So that alone could make you be healthier. Well, I, I think to a life. certain extent, to a certain extent, I find that disgusting because I like coffee, mate. <laughs> in my, in my <laughs> coffee and like I can't, and <laughs> you can't get it here. And so <laughs> it's like, you know, like they used to say when you would uh, get off the, the, one of the rides in, it was a Tomorrowland in Disneyland. Disney. It, it was something about molecules and it was owned, sponsored by Monsanto. And they'd say, you know, remember without chemicals, life itself would be virtually impossible. So no, the, yeah, you can't get certain things like you can't get sweet and low. Yeah, and, well, I gave up that because now I call that pink poison. Yeah, you have to pick your poison. I mean, you <laughs> have sugar. It's yeah, That's not right. great for you. I don't know. Everything's going to kill you at right. some point. But but um, they don't sell that. So I think, the, well, the thing is, you know, you look around here and at least what I noticed in Barcelona and much of Spain is people are thin, I mean, you go out on the street and there's like hotties everywhere and this well, like no one will the, be looking at me. That's for sure. The, I uh, mean, just like the younger people like are in great shape. You see girls walking around the street and they're just like beautiful, great bodies, guys, not a, an ounce of fat. And I have a feeling that has a lot to do with not consuming as much fast food as Americans do. It's got to, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it's here. They have fast food, obviously, but I don't think that's a habit that they've gotten into. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I know they still have fast food restaurants there from the U S like, Burger yeah, they King just opened up, they just opened up a Popeye's chicken close oh, by God. here. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> no, but I know, but w look, when you live abroad for a while, at a certain point, you're like, hmm, fried chicken that sounds, sounds enticing. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Haven't gone there yet, but we will, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about, we talked a little bit about public transportation. You said the train system is great. What's the traffic system like and how close are you to the airport, to the Barcelona airport? Downtown Barcelona, or what, it's not really called downtown, but 
in the main part of Barcelona. It's about a 20 minute, 25 minute drive by bus if there's no traffic or 24, 26 minutes by Metro. And so it's a little out of town, but it's close enough that, you know, 24 minutes is nothing. The Metro, the city is well covered by the Metro. There are, uh, I don't know exactly how many lines there are, but pretty much anywhere you want to go, there's a Metro line. And the trains come every two, three, four minutes, as long as I might wait is like four minutes for a Metro. There's trams, buses, and uh, there are trains that go outside of the Metro zone that go to other parts of the coast or other parts of Spain. And they're all very reasonably priced. They allow dogs, which is good for us. And it's just the network is works really well. Right now, you can get a Metro Pass for 20 euros a month that gives you access to everything, even going to the airport. So that's a pretty good. Normally, it's 40 euros. They've lowered it to kind of show that they're sympathetic to the economy, you know, meaning. Uh, let's avoid a revolution. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. But so that, the price is, the, I mean, even at 40 euros a month, that's a bargain. Yeah, absolutely. So that's excellent. And there are taxis that are inexpensive. I mean, if you want to go, say, a 20 minute taxi ride is maybe 10 to 12 euros. So I think the dollar is close to the euro right now. So 10 or 12 dollars. Yeah. I mean, that's not bad. No, not at all. Have you ever been on the high speed rail? I have. Like, yeah. And how's I, that? I just recently went to Madrid and I took the, uh, the high speed train there. The, let's see, it took two hours and 30 minutes from Barcelona to the middle of Madrid that's it's, great. I went on their first class. It was beautiful, huge, like business class type seats. They serve leg room. food, tons of leg room. And it's fast. The scenery is like kind of boring. There's not a lot to see, but it's a great, it's smooth. It's fast. It's easy. Yeah. I'd rather do that than fly. Oh yeah. To go, go, the airport here is actually relatively easy to deal with, but like every place else, you got to go through security and passport right. control and all this other well, crap. And it's just yeah. like, it's, it, it adds to the stress here. Yes. You just, if you know what platform you're going to, you can get there five minutes before and you're fine. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Lately with all the different lines and, you know, I do stress out, yeah. you know, going to the airport and so oh yeah it's, it's gotten thing. It, it used to be fun and now right. it's just something it's that you want to avoid it's like going to the dentist yeah yeah it really is how about the traffic situation is barcelona crazy with traffic no i don't think so i mean during certain times of the day there's obviously a rush hour and, and it can be bumper to bumper in areas i've driven quite a bit in the city and it's way more to me way more relaxing than driving in los angeles i mean that just to give you an idea people are n not aggressive at least i don't i haven't found drivers to be overly aggressive and it's i don't know people just they don't they just kind of go with it and they don't get too bent out of shape again it's if you don't need a car here or you don't really need a car here, you just take metros and all that. But if you were driving, it's pretty easy to get around here. Parking yeah, is a, you know, parking is a bitch, but right. you know, it's a major city. It's a major city yeah. like New York. Yep. Okay. So how's the infrastructure? So like from where you live, can you actually walk to the market, to the bank, to the pharmacy, to restaurants. Can you walk everywhere pretty much? Like if you needed, you know, if you had an emergency and you needed a hospital, 
is it 10 minutes away? Is it 20 minutes away? Well, in a way, it's like living in any city, like a New York city. It's not like living in LA or anything like that here, but it, but obviously it's European. So we walk to the supermarket. We walk to the bakery. We walk to restaurants. We do a lot. We're big walk- walkers. And I would say <laughs> we average, I mean, some days we walk 15,000 steps and other days we walk 25,000 steps. That's so, a lot of steps. So we're walkers. It doesn't bother us. But it does it, it does limit like what you can carry if you go to the supermarket. We have one of those like old lady carts. Yep. I heard everybody does. And, yeah. And so we do that and we stock up on water and food and stuff like that. And it's easy. Our super, we have two really good supermarkets that are close by. There's one that's, they're both about four blocks, three, three, one's three, one's four blocks away. And uh, they have pretty much everything you need. And like I said, there's, if you decided you wanted to go, like if you wanted to buy your meat at a butcher shop, there's butcher shops and there's all that stuff. It's very like, I think how people probably would have perceived old living in New York, like, New York. you know, well, yeah, yeah. So I guess it's the same thing in New York. So there, the, but I'm thinking like more old world where it's in like, this- you know, you buy kind of the food you need for the day or so. Like I'll go to the supermarket and I buy for dinner or I'll buy for dinner and maybe tomorrow night's dinner, but I'm not necessarily buying. It's not my ha- shopping habits aren't the same as if I lived in the US and I was like getting in my car and going to Costco and right stocking up for Armageddon, you know. <laughs> right. Right. That's the difference. So, yeah, today, you know, we drive everywhere, so we go to Costco, we go to the supermarkets, we buy for at least a week, you know, even vegetables and fruit. Whereas <clears throat> I'm comparing like cities in Spain like Barcelona, where everything is local and the infrastructure is more walkable. So you're able to walk to the market or walk to the butcher. And I equate that to like 60s living or 70s living in New York, where they had a butcher, they had a baker and a candlestick thing. (laughs) Everything was separate. It wasn't all these super places where you could buy everything and stock up forever. It's just basically, you know, if you want for one or two days. And that's why I kind of think that even in Spain, most of the refrigerators are even smaller. Yeah, Yeah, we actually looked at an apartment that had one of those undercounter refrigerators. And we're like, no, the sneak. That's hard to get used to. But, you know, there's a lot of neighborhoods have these big supermercados, these Il Corte uh, well, they ha- oh, that one has a great market down below in the basement. It has a great supermarket. But they have these markets that are in these old, you know, from the 1890s steel structures or, you know, like the Eiffel Tower. Uh, I'm trying to think of what that material is. But th- these old steel and glass structures and inside there'll be fruit vendors and meat vendors and seafood vendors and all kinds of stuff. And it, those are great. The Mercados. Yeah. The big mer- Love those. Mercados. Love those. Yeah. So I kind of like that way of life, you know, it's totally different than what we have now. Yeah. It's totally different than what most Americans are used to. And I, it didn't take us long to adapt to it because, you know, when you're here, you're like, oh, this is really cool. You go in and there's like, know, 10 or 15 fruit and vegetable vendors and you pick, we basically pick, there are a couple that we just like, it's very strange in Spain, a lot of the fruit and vegetable sellers have a bug up their ass. You can't, they don't want you to touch anything, which is like, huh. That's to, to me, that's total bullshit. I do like, to, I do touchy feely on everything. Well, yeah, you've got to, you've got to touch fruits and vegetables and see what's going on. Yeah. And but the, so once once we get somebody who scolds us, we're like that vendor out gone, <laughs> you know. But it's nice to have that, and then also we'll, I, I'll find 
vendors who are selling meats and cheeses. So to me, I'm like, mm. that salami looks good. And that cheese looks, this is why I'm gaining weight. Cause I'm like, yeah, I'm got to try that. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, the there's a lot. I'm on, yeah. uh, you know, their ham is excellent. Yeah. It's really excellent. Yeah. So I'm not really a ham eater, uh -huh. but I know when I go to Spain, I'm going to check some mm -hmm. out. Yeah. It's very good here. In fact, so, when I came back from the U S on my last, uh, I mean, when I came back to the U S on my last visit, when I got through custom, I'm going through customs and the guy is like, do you have any ham with you? I'm like, what? Ham? <laughs> like, ham? Why, why would I have, have ham? He goes, oh, a lot of people bring ham back. I'm like, oh shit. Hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> That's pretty good. And pharmacies are right by you. Like you can everywhere. walk into a pharmacy. Ev everywhere. Yeah. That's great. The, the one downside is it's not like in places like Mexico where, where you can, you know, if you feel like you want to get an antibiotic or something, you can just go in and say. Into a pharmacy. Yeah. You need to have a prescription, which, you know, I'm used to, of course, living in the U.S. But when we lived in Chile and Argentina, in Chile, they're, they're a little stricter than in Argentina. But in, in Chile, if I wanted something, I could go into a pharmacy and they would ask me, oh, do you have a prescription or whatever? And I say, oh, I'm a doctor. They go, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. No proof. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> okay. Cool. Do you <clears throat> have you ever gone to Sitges? We have. Sitges is I think a 45 minute train ride from central Barcelona and it is a wonderful old style village that's grown up they have kept it very quaint so it's not they don't allow big buildings so it's still got that old world charm and uh, it's just a, a great little beach town and in fact we're well i say we're julian is looking for an apartment there he wants to buy an apartment there all right so i just did a podcast on citrus so yeah so i uh, quite interesting so if he wants to get an apartment there, I'll probably end up, we'll probably end up getting one. So you'll have both, like that's the beachy apartment and you'll keep the Barcelona yeah. apartment. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is our business has been buying and selling, investing in real estate. So for us, it's, it serves dual purpose, you know? Right. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So tell us about the crime. So it's a big city. Does it have, do you think it has any more crime than any other big city? Would you feel safe going out at night and walking your dog? I know guns are not allowed in, in Spain like they are here in the U.S. Tell us a little bit about the crime. So the, anecdotally, I feel that the city is very safe. I read an article recently from, I don't think it was, it could have been USA Today or U US News and World Report. I'll get it wrong. But uh, Barcelona is ranked as the fourth safest city in Spain. Now, I, you know, you could probably go on somebody else's survey site and see different numbers, but we walk our dogs at night a lot. And there's never a problem. People, the streets are quiet. It's mellow. I know that Barcelona has a reputation of pickpocketing in the touristy areas. So whenever we're in the touristy areas that are really crowded and just, you know, densely populated, we act like New Yorkers. You know, we put our wallets in our front pockets and we keep our heads on a swivel. And right. You put we, in, you put on a resting bitch face. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's always on, <laughs> but, but you know, we take big, we're big city people. So we take big city precautions, yeah. but the crime here from, it's my understanding that the crime here is mostly just petty theft and it does happen. Obviously, I mean, you can get ripped off by a taxi driver or some, you know, somebody trying to pick your pocket in the metro, but I don't know. I feel very safe here. I was just in Los Angeles. I grew up there. You know, I go and visit family and friends and 
I don't feel safe in Los Angeles. You know, right. I, I just, I don't. And like New York too. So or- they, you can, I think you can buy a rifle here. I don't really know exactly. I think most of the EU is you can't can a handgun or anything like that. In the US, you know, from, from my line of work, because we owned apartment complexes in sometimes in in somewhat sketchy areas i always carried but i don't have any feeling that i'm missing anything but by not having a gun at all i feel perfectly i really do i feel perfectly safe and it, to me that's not an issue it's a complete non issue hopefully it'll remain that way but it's a non issue but I think that the city's a, a very safe place. We've gone to dinner and, and with friends and had a few gl- glasses, bottles of wine, and you know, practically stumbling home, and it's fine. Nobody fine. bothers you. And you know, I heard something here that surprised me. That some locals were telling me that in. Barcelona and Madrid, especially, but here in Barcelona, that if you are found, if somebody like, if you're like, and this would never happen to me because I just don't drink that much. But if you were like drinking, you went to a bar and you stumbled out of a bar and you were just shit faced and you're like sitting on a curb or something, people will come and walk you home. They will help you home. That's like a thing here. I mean, that's unheard that here. of. That, you wouldn't see un- that here. No. You'd be They'd be like, oh, yeah. who is this person? Yeah. Anyways, like I say, some of this is anecdotal because I don't have the, <laughs> I don't have the facts, right. uh, the data at handy, but I've read articles that say it's safe and I feel safe. So when we go walk the dogs at nine o'clock at night, I never think twice about it. That's good. That's good. Because when I walk the dogs here at night, I kind of still have that over the shoulder look you know yeah, is somebody I mean, behind yeah, me that's normal you'd probably want to but i don't feel i obviously again i try to keep aware of my surroundings but yeah i just i don't sweat it yeah how about how about the homeless population is there a homeless population like there is here in some N- cities nothing like in the u.s in barcelona I don't know the exact numbers. There are homeless people around, but it's nothing like being in LA or New York or Chicago. No, nothing. No I mean, tent just, cities. No, I, maybe they exist outside of town. I've never seen them, and I don't know. I don't know exactly why that is happening more in the U.S. than it does in European cities, but. It doesn't appear to be too much of a problem here. I do see homeless people, but it's, I, I don't feel like it's out of control. Like you do, like in LA, you could be driving on the freeway and you'll see tent cities lining the freeways. Here, you don't see that. And this is anecdotal too. So someone told me that in Spain, the Spaniards are very family oriented and they take care of their Mm -hmm. family. So if a person is down and out and had no money and was about to go homeless, they wouldn't allow that to happen. In most cases, they would take them in. Well, that could be the difference. That could be. I mean, in, in Chile, you didn't see that many homeless people because they're really family oriented and that could account for some of it. But, and this is a very complex issue, so it's really hard to know without studying this in depth what the causes are and why people are homeless. There are right. a lot of people that are homeless it- just because they're either completely bonkers yep. or, you know, I mean, or drug addicts or what whatnot. I, you know, so it's really hard to say why it's one way in the U S and why it's, it's different here. I just, I haven't studied it. I don't know because I mean, in the U S there are plenty of people who choose to be homeless. They, and I, and I know people would say to me bullshit, but I mean, there are people who are just, they don't, you know, they're just not 
all that tightly, you know, there, there's, uh, yeah, there's something different, you know, they're just, yeah. they think differently. Yes. Yes. All right. Tell us about the health care. Are there a sufficient number of doctors to accommodate the population? How about health insurance from the U.S.? Do you keep Medicare? Do you know about that? Or Yeah. So tell us. in Spain, the healthcare system is highly rated on a worldwide scale. I, it typically ranks somewhere between in the top 15, I think, top 20 in the world. And people here seem to like it. Fortunately, I have not had an experience with it. I did have a friend who had experience with it. We had a friend who is around my age, 62, 63. And he came home to his apartment and at night and just slipped on the stairs, just, you know, one of those stupid missed, misstep yep, on, on marble stairs, fell, hit his head and was bleeding profusely. Now, fortunately Oof. for him, he was wearing one of these Apple watches and he didn't even know this existed, but he's on the floor and now he's just like bleeding profusely. Off. And the Apple watch, a voice comes on and says, have you fallen? You know, a, a thing. And it's a yes. And do you need an ambulance? Yes. Three minutes, three minutes. Wow. An ambulance was there. They patched him up, took him to the hospital. He spent the night in the hospital, got, he said he got excellent care and uh, had a very, you know, good experience with the medical system. That's a good reason for me to get an Apple watch. Yeah, no, I know when he told us this, we were like, oh, shit, we should get one of those things. <laughs> All right. So the, you know, the scary part is that if you're from the U.S., as you know, I mean, if you don't have health insurance, you can be wiped out. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's definitely a concern. I worked in the motion picture industry for almost three decades. So I built up a retirement fund or a, you know, part of my retirement package it, through motion picture industry pension and health plan is that at age 62, I'm eligible for lifetime health benefits for not only me, but for my partner or husband. So I just turned 62 a few months ago and I was able to apply for that portion of my retirement. And so now we have Blue Cross Anthem in the U.S., which will cover us anywhere in the world. If you know, for traveling or living outside the U.S., we just oh, you're you, lucky. It just applies differently. So we would have to instead of instead of them paying the doctor directly, they would reimburse us. But medical costs are way lower. That said, we because we are residents here, part of the requirement to become residents is that you have to have your own health insurance. Right. <clears throat> so we purchased medical and dental coverage, which is just about, it's just under a hundred euros per person per month. And That's it's, a good deal. it's supposed to be excellent coverage. Like I say, we haven't had, we haven't had to use it. Thank God. So I, I, yeah, so I don't know, but in the meantime, I'm not there. I'm not giving up my U S health insurance because it's there, you know, it's part of my right. retirement plan. So I don't sure. really have to do anything with that. Right. And that's great. And if something happened here that, w that wasn't covered within the system or whatever, I can just go out of system and out of pocket. And then either get reimbursed for from Blue Cross or, you know, just pay it out of pocket. You have the best of both worlds. Plus, after a year of being a resident, you're entitled to their their social medicine or their free system. So you'll be able to sign up for that because I believe that you don't you haven't been paying into their social security or whatever. That might cost a small amount, I think, but before you're 65, something like it's like $60 a month per person for the socialized medicine 
to the free health Well, so we're everything. paying 90. It, I haven't looked into it any further than what we're paying right now. And I don't know if, <clears throat> I don't know if, if what we have is better than the other system or it's the same. You know, I don't really know exactly all. I'm going to claim stupid on this one. <laughs> I'm not really sure which one is better or if they're, or if they're really the same and they just get billed differently. Right. I think the difference also between the socialized medicine and private insurance is in the socialized world, it's going to take a longer time to get an appointment than it would be on the private because the private, you get to choose your doctors. You pretty much have a lot of freedom there. Yeah. Appointments are within days. They even, I've heard where people are sick and they didn't want to go out and the private insurance people call the a house a doctor to make a house call. So yeah, the, that, the, the, the free in air quotes, the free medical isn't free, right? It's, there are pretty heavy taxes here. Yeah. And so there's no such thing as a free lunch. It sounds good. Most Americans are like, Oh, I want that free healthcare. Free but, healthcare you know, it, com but, it comes at a cost. We yeah. pay 21% value added tax on right. everything. Yeah, and I mean, even when you, we remodeled the apartment that we bought, we remodeled it and on top of the contractor's fee and on top of the materials fee, you have to pay 21%. Now, if it's your first time doing this, the, they give you a break and you can reduce it down to 10%, but that's like for the first time. But everything else you buy, whether it's, you know, a car or I don't know if food falls under this category, but damn near everything does. Everything has 21% added to it. It's, it, not free. it's yeah, there's a price for sure. Yeah. Do you have a hospital nearby? There are some hospitals nearby, but there are also the ambulance services here are excellent. And like I say, I have not fortunately had to deal with this. But from people that we know who have, that they say, you know, things are close by. There's the services here are excellent. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, so I'm, cities, I'm not just Barcelona. It's it, they must have great hospitals, too. And also, you know, here, I mean, you get an ambulance and people do move out of the way. People drive very civilized here. So people do move out of the way. It's not like you're just going to be stuck in traffic and dying from a heart attack. Now, now, I hope you haven't jinxed me and I'm going to like, good night. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Let's <laughs> hope not. <laughs> okay. How about visa requirements? What, how do you go? Oh, and I, I want to, oh, I'm sorry. Can I backtrack a bit? Yeah, sure. So uh, in terms of one of the things about Spain where people are, you know, Americans, we tend to sometimes be a little arrogant about certain things and one of the things that Americans are always afraid of, especially when you're considering retiring and all that, and people are like, well, you know, other countries or I don't know about the healthcare system and I don't know about the this and the that. Well, the World Bank Group places Spain at number eight in life expectancy with an average age of 83. The U.S., on the other hand, is ranked number 54 with life expectancy wow. of 77. You know, you have to keep certain things in mind. I mean, look, I've lived my, you know, my lifestyle. Higher life. In, so I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay for <clears throat> that, you know, coming up, but I'm not out in some barbaric, you know, right. like place where, you know, all hell is going to break loose. There's a pretty good life expectancy here. So. Uh, you know. Yeah, that's important. And that makes me, I was going to say, oh, I should just definitely move to Spain and gain oh, a yeah, you'll years. gain. Yeah, you'll gain five years. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, instead of 77, you know, I'm 65 now. Yeah, you'll gain six years, six years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. that's <laughs> like the time reason. change. Absolutely. <laughs> so tell us about what you went through to obtain a visa, or maybe your situation was a little bit different because of your husband because he was really yeah no it he, really doesn't matter where you're from it's going to be a little bit of a, a pain in the ass so we decided you can do this on your own if you want but we decided to 
hire a law firm and a like a relocation logistics company to help us deal with the paperwork. And to me, if you can afford, that's the way you want to go. I mean, it. I guess a lot of it depends on your tolerance for pain, how much and how hard you want to hit your head against the wall. Right. And we just figured, you know, it's not that expensive to pay a professional to do it. So we hired a company that has, it's like a combination law firm. And uh, they, yeah, they do all kinds of stuff. And they helped us apply for our, our visa. The first thing, but before I tell you that what our process was, Americans need to understand that there is, the EU is different from most countries in terms of Americans or Canadians coming and staying and being there for 90 days and then leaving and then coming back. So your passport allows you, it has a built-in visa that allows you in, gives you 90 days. In the EU, something like 26 countries in the EU are in this thing called the Schengen area. It's this agreement that where they protect the outside borders, but within there's free flow. So you can go anywhere you want in the EU without borders. But they have strict regulations in terms of how long you can stay. So for Americans and Canadians and most other people from outside the EU, you can stay a total of 90 days during any 180 day period, which means, and it starts from the day that you enter, which means if you stayed a month and left and, and left the country, left the EU, and then came back and stayed another month. Now you have 60 days in this 180-day period that moves with you. And once you reach the 90 days, you're an overstay if you stay one more day. So you don't want to get into a situation that if you're going to come to move to Spain or move to any place in the EU with the hopes of maybe finding an apartment, buying an apartment and just staying and then applying for residency, you need to be aware of this 90-180 rule because you don't want to be stuck in a situation where you've got to leave the country. So they Spain offers a visa called a non-lucrative visa that allows you to stay in the country for up to a year. But the only stipulation is that you can't work here. So if you're retired, who cares, right? But right. this gives you time to now come to Spain and check out where you might want to live to see, you know, maybe you don't want to live here, but it gives you time to not be rushed and to be constantly looking at a calendar to see if you've got to get out. So the, right. so, so we got a non-lucrative visa and then the, we purchased, we decided to go get residency through a golden visa program, which is essentially it's residency by investment. And there are a couple <laughs> of different ways you can open a business. You can, there are you can invest in certain particular government bonds, but we decided to go with a real estate option, which allows you to purchase a property for 500,000 euros or more per person. And it gives you the ability to apply for a visa and you'll be granted one. And since we're a married couple, we could do buying the property and then one of us becoming the dependent of the other so that you buy the property, one person gets granted the golden visa, and then the other person applies. But it, it's almost basically simultaneous if you do it through an attorney. And But even with using an attorney or using a logistics company, 
you need to be aware of the rules and regulations because they don't always know. And sometimes we found ourselves telling them like, this doesn't look right. And they're like, oh, oh, now you're right. So you kind of have to be, keep vigilant. Top of it. But it's, you know, we got from the day we set foot in Spain to the day that we were granted permanent residency was eight months, total of eight months. So that's not too bad. No. And then and did they do everything? The attorneys, did they actually do the paperwork and send the paperwork to the embassy? Yes. So they do the paperwork. Of course, you have to tell them what to say on things. And you have to, there's certain things that you have to do too. You have, there are plenty of hoops to jump through, but there. Did you have to go to the embassy in person or no? No, no, oh, no. Wow. So we fill out the paperwork, but we have to provide them. So the hoops, the types of hoops that you have to jump through is that you have to prove that you have enough money to support yourself. And the threshold for that, for a non-lucrative visa, the threshold, I believe, is 30,000 US per person. So it's not, not bad, right? And the so you have to have that in savings to be able to draw from at least that. And then the other kind of hoops that we had to jump through were things like providing bank statements, providing some, we had to provide, I think, some tax returns. We had to provide, we had to do fingerprints and then have them sent to the US to have the FBI check them out FBI to make sure check. we weren't cri criminals. And the marriage certificate thing is another one of those kind of hoop jumping things. This is something that we weren't really told about. I mean, I had, we had our marriage certificate that was certified from the US. And then it's like, we find out right when we're ready to do it, they're like, oh no, it has to be within 90 days. We're like, well, maybe you could have told us that, you know, it's stuff like that, ago. that just ag aggravating, right? Right. And trying to get a, a marriage certificate, a copy, a certified copy of a marriage certificate from Europe is not easy. So I, Julian traveled back to California, stayed with my mother, and then went to the courthouse and got our and marriage got certificate so that it fit within the 90 days. And then once you get it certified and bring it back, you have to have it, what they call postulated, which means, you know, you pay somebody a fee and they stamp it. So there are a few little hoops to jump through and it can be a it can be a little nerve wracking along the way because you're just like, uh, hurry, get it done, you I know, just, but just don't. yeah, but I wouldn't recommend doing it on your own. If, I mean, like I say, if you're the type of person that likes to bang your head against the wall, have at it. Right. And <laughs> if you have nothing to do. Yeah. <laughs> How about Spain has a wealth tax? I'm not sure if Barcelona they, yeah. is one of the cities that yeah. does. <laughs> yeah. Spain definitely has a wealth tax. Well, they have a wealth tax. They have an inheritance tax. And it's... What are the deductions for the wealth tax? I'm not really... I'm not really well versed in it. I have just hired an accounting firm here to deal with it because I've got some, you know, we had businesses and we have, we, we have things going on that we may or may not want to talk about on a podcast. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Put okay. it that way. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Nothing illegal. It's just that, you know, here no, in Europe, if you sneeze the wrong way, you know, the government's got their hand out for their share. What I think it is, uh, you automatically get a deduction of 700000 That's what I think. So on your income tax, so you don't have to pay wealth tax provided you don't have income or assets worth 700000 No, you can, it's higher. You can have higher assets than that, yeah. But you have Where, to pay wealth tax, right? No, you don't have to pay a wealth tax. So no. I think that doesn't kick in. And I don't know the exact figure. It's quite, it's significantly higher than that. Okay. So that's per person. Yeah. So yeah, if you're fortunate enough to have, you know, 
few million dollars in the bank mm-hmm. and yeah. you move here, I don't believe you're going to be taxed on that because that's money you already have. It's when you have, I'm going to get this wrong, but maybe more in the $20 million range, then you're, you are subject to a different level. But I don't believe, like if you have a net worth of around 5 million, I don't think you're going to be paying really anything in like a tax because otherwise nobody's going to come here. Right. But you will pay if you inherit if you inherit money, if you inherit property, you will pay on that 30 like yeah. 30 30 35 percent. So it's Got significant. It. That's how all these free services are free. Right. You know? Yeah. So what do you wish that you had or what would you wish that was in Barcelona that you don't have that you may have had elsewhere? Is there anything you miss? Good hot pastrami sandwich. Yum. Yeah. There are no good delis here. That I do miss. I miss a nice, good Jewish deli. From uh, Sherman's. Where I can get a, a Sherman's. Wasn't that in Palm Springs? It was in Palm Springs. I, it maybe still <laughs> is. But yeah, I, there are no delis here. So I wish there were delis. I'm trying to think of, there's good Thai food, but... I wish there was better and more of it, but I don't really miss much. I mean, they're like, you'd think, oh, hot dogs or something as simple like Americana, but there, I found like some great brands of hot dogs that like have a nice snap to them and are crunchy and just great. Plenty. I mean, there's, if you really need a greasy burger, there's a five guys here. You know, there's a few five guys here. So no, I don't feel like I miss, there's not much that I miss here. Okay. Fair enough. So do you have any cons? Is there any cons of living in Barcelona? I don't think so. I, I have, we've been here about 18 months and I can't think of any. It's great. Yeah. No, we're happy. I, I, I just don't, I don't see any cons here. That's I'm great. sure that maybe they exist for some people. Yeah. Wonderful. When wrapping up, what would you say to our audience if they're thinking about relocating to Barcelona? Well, I think, you know, I'm biased because I live here and now and I, we really enjoy it. I'd say come take a trip. It, you'll have a great time. It, the city is just really cosmopolitan. It's got so much going for it. It's got incredible museums. It's got incredible architecture. I mean, there's like Gaudi buildings and just exquisite modernist buildings. And there are great restaurants, great. The people are super friendly. There's, if you're, if you really want like a gay community, there's tons of gay people here, super gay friendly nobody will give you grief for anything and it's just it's an easy place to live if you want to you, you have beaches that are close by if you want to get in a car you can be up and you know you can drive up to paris you can go you can drive to the south of france it's just a great place to be weather's awesome and it's it's relaxed, especially if you're coming from like the U.S. has been pretty tense the last couple of years and everybody's at each other's throats over stupidities that they can't control anyways, you know. And uh, so it's just it's to me, it's a breath of fresh air to be able sure. to just come to a place where it's like I'm sure, you know, maybe uh, locals probably argue about their politics, too. But it's like, who cares? You know, I can't change the world. And I just want to be, I want to live in peace and relax. And I think it's a great place to, to come visit and check it out. And I can't imagine that too many people would not like it here. If you like going, you know, if you want to live on the coast of Del Sol or coast of Brava, there's some just incredible beach communities and right on the Mediterranean, it's peaceful and it's just, it's awesome. Sounds like my kind of place. Yeah, it's good. 
Well, Reed, thank you so much for joining the podcast. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll meet in person someday. Yes, we'll come visit. And we have guest facilities. We have a guest suite. Oh, that's great. You're welcome that's to stay. That's great, sir. But uh, oh. thanks for having me. Sure. And hopefully it's our didn't... pleasure. Thanks it's again, great, Reed. Great place. No, thank you. You're Take welcome. care. Bye -bye. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Where Do Gays Retire podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast and consider making a donation by clicking the coffee cup on any page at www.wheredogaysretire.com. Each cup of coffee that you buy costs $5 and goes towards helping us continue the podcast. Thank you for your continued support.